Welcome back to CivilNet. This is the second day that we're covering live the events in Vil Vilnius, the many events in Vilnius. There's actually also a business conference in Vilnius that we're not covering. I don't know if you're grateful for that or not. We are covering, of course, the summit that is taking place still now today, uh, where the presidents are currently in the plenary session that is closed to the public and to cameras. The second day today is also the second day of the civil society platform, a summit meeting that includes very high level names, foreign ministers, current and past, and others from Eastern Europe, Europe, uh, talking about the future of civil society in this uh, post-Eastern partnership moment, perhaps. And so asking those questions here in the studio as well as me of Mikhail Zolian, who's a political analyst of whom we don't have too many. Um, and we're going to ask, I, I guess this is really the same question, the post Vilnius moment kind of where we're all having to look in the mirror and try to figure out who screwed up, where, how, why, and where we go from here. Those are simple questions, right? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I, I'm an optimist and I'm trying to remain an optimist uh, all the time and to look for the silver lining. So in this case, I think the silver lining is that only 10 years ago, uh, even this level of relations between EU and our country seemed uh, not realistic. I should have and invited you yesterday morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, 15 years ago, you know, Ar Armenia or Georgia or Azerbaijan, they were not even considered Europe, frankly. So. And, I don't know, 20 years ago, there were Soviet tanks on the streets of Vilnius. So there is progress. Uh, it's another issue that the progress is more slow. It's, it's happening slowly. And, uh, of course, we want uh, it to happen faster, but it, it, it doesn't happen faster. I mean, uh, one problem is that uh, for most European Union members, European Union has 28 members, and for the majority of these members, this is not a priority issue. Ukraine and uh, even Ukraine and more so Armenia, or Georgia, or Azerbaijan or Belarus, they are not priority for countries like Spain or mm. France or Italy who are more interested in the southern neighborhood of European Union. Uh, Germany, uh, this region is important for Germany, but there are many things important for Germany. And right now Germany is not in the mood to uh, support any kind of enlargement, even if it's not enlargement, but something that has the perspective of enlargement in the future. So, Except that this was one of those that, if enlargement means we get a lot of benefits, this is one of those where Europe would have benefited from that stable, progressive, democratic, prosperous neighborhood that is less likely to uh, go to conflicts. So they would have kind of benefited without necessarily giving all of the benefits of full membership. So in this case, as much as we sort of lost those little levers that this kind of agreement would have given us, they too have lost a little bit, no? Uh, of course they have, because first of all, they suffered a blow to their credibility as a, you know, as a political actor in this region, because uh, right now it seems that Russia has more leverage and uh, you know, the methods that Russia uses or maybe U.S. Uh, is using, they're more effective than the methods that European Union is using. I think one of the reasons for why this happened is that uh, people in uh, European structures, they don't really understand the nature of the post-Soviet elites. They believe that, which is a normal assumption for most countries, that the elite is representing the society and it is acting in the best interests of the country. However, it doesn't always work that way in post-Soviet space, where the most elites that we have, they are the, you know, they used to be communists, then they became nationalist, now they might talk about European integration, but Maybe tomorrow they, they, yeah, I mean, they, they, they use this language of democracy, human rights, but tomorrow if uh, there's a certain change happening in terms of their interest, private interest, uh, they, they might start talking about Eurasian integration. And uh, that's, that's where Europeans, uh, you know, they kind of miscalculated. They thought they that if- They misinterpret. Yes, I mean, they, they think that if they have a negotiation process with the government, it means that the government is on board, which is not necessarily so, because the government may have another negotiation process with someone else. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying that the government completely ignores the interests of the country, but if uh, taking a certain decision might involve the risk of losing power, 
which in this case, at least in Ukraine and Armenia, it was obviously that uh, continuing this process would mean a risk of losing power, then the government is not going to do that. And uh, this is what happened in case of Armenia and Ukraine. And if, if you look at the six countries of Eastern Partnership, there's a correlation between the level of democracy and whether they went as all the way. As. So in case of Georgia and Moldova, you have uh, governments which have been elected through more or less democratic elections, and they signed it. Uh, in case of uh, Armenia, well, we all know the situation. In case of Ukraine, maybe you have a government which also was elected more or less democratically, but also there were violations. And the most important thing is the selective justice issue. A former prime minister is in prison, and of course the Europeans are demanding its release, but the Ukrainian uh, elite, well, part of the elite mm -hmm. which is ruling, they don't want it because you know, by releasing Timoshenko, Yanukovych would have created a new, an, uh, a new headache for him. So, so he prefers to leave the things the way they are rather than take a risk. The, the part of this that's really interesting is that on the one hand, uh, even as they're discussing external support, huh, that's the, the panel right now head, uh, headed by the, from someone from National Endowment for Democracy, the United States National Endowment for Democracy, either as they're talking, even as they're talking about external support, it seems that the key civil society actors, the ones that are there, those of us here asking these questions, seem to have come to a position where we're saying that A, yes, we do need external support, and maybe the European leadership now will also see that, and B, external support or no external support. At the end of the day, Europe, Brussels, 28 countries couldn't do this. And the only person left is us. Is that something that we can take away from this? Is that an understanding that our local civil society can take away from this, that the burden on us is much heavier than we thought it was, or we wanted it to be? Well, I, I think in any case, uh, after all, everything depends on us. And, uh, Again, this example of Ukraine and Armenia on the one hand and Georgia and Moldova on the other hand, this shows that after all, uh, a lot depends on the, of course, geopolitics, geopolitical factors are important, but after all, it depends on how uh, on what is the situation inside the country. If you have a more or less healthy political system with functioning government, opposition, elections, free media, uh, relatively, of course, in a, in a relatively, because neither Moldova nor Georgia are, sure. you know, uh, <laughs> <Our> <laughs> ideally the, the old ethos. But after all, there is a certain degree. So mm -hmm. if you look at these six countries, again, you see two countries where there's no, you know, uh, Belarus and Azerbaijan, they didn't even, uh, you know, there was no even question of signing the CFTA. No. There was Armenia and Ukraine, which are somewhere in the middle, and eventually it happened the way it happened. And then we had Moldova and Georgia, where uh, the, the local, uh, the civil society, the politicians, the media, they uh, have a sense of direction where they're heading. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not something we have here in Armenia and not something people have in Ukraine. I mean, in Ukraine, there are two camps. Uh, in Armenia, until recently, uh, I wouldn't even say there are two camps. I mean, there was at least maybe one of the, uh, you know, another silver lining in this whole situation is that finally there's a debate in Armenia which direction we need to take, which is uh, more, you know, uh, uh, important for us in long term, which is more uh, suitable in short term. And I think that's a useful discussion. We have to continue it. But uh, the biggest problem right now for Armenia, I wouldn't say is that we are joining this or that uh, project or we are not joining another project. The biggest problem is that right now the um, ability of our government to take independent decision is at stake. The way it happened, I mean, uh, the way Armenia announced that it's going to join the customs union, it uh, shows that our government is not fully able to take independent decisions. I mean, uh, it was announcing about its willingness to go in one direction and then in one day it changed the direction. I mean, I would prefer a government which had been for, for several years saying that we want to join the customs union, but independently on the basis of its own political agenda rather than this government, which changes its, uh, which makes a complete U-turn and obviously this U-turn was not conditioned by internal factors. So I think that's the biggest issue that Armenian civil society has to address now and political forces and even the relatively, you know, those people inside the government who have an understanding of the country's interests. They, they have to act and they have to act now. Is it possible that one of the ways that Armenian civil society is going to find uh, 
useful silver linings here or implement the possible silver linings that are now offered to us. Is it possible that one of the ways is simply public debate? That is, it's possible nobody asked us our opinion, but nevertheless we have some, and we're going to talk about it and make it as loud and visible and consistent and continuous as we can so that it has to be reckoned with, so that somebody has to take some of that into consideration. It's interesting that today and yesterday in Vilnius, when Yanukovych approached, uh, the Ukrainian uh, NGOs were there with placards uh, expressing their disdain, their disagreement with the president's decision. Armenian NGOs were not. Uh, Ukrainian NGOs are a substantive part of this discourse that we've been following these two days. Armenian NGOs, individuals from NGOs certainly, you know, bravo, but not in any uh, critical mass sort of way. Maybe this is that point that tells us whether any, anybody asks you for your opinion or not, too bad. If you have it, you need to be out there. That de this debate with all of its gray area, not just making it black and white, do we want Russia or the EU? That's a silly question. But all of its gray area that now the onus is on us to get out there. Well, uh, so some Armenian NGOs have been active and there was a civil society platform for Eastern Partnerships, so they've been trying to get the message out. The problem is that until recently, because it seemed that the government was doing the correct thing, so the NGOs were in a, in a kind of uh, you know, uh, difficult situation because on the one hand, I don't think anyone in the civil society trusted completely the government's actions, but on the other hand, criticizing the government would make no sense in this situation because the Europeans would say, okay, the government is doing everything that it promised to do, you know, why, why are you critical of them? So uh, in this sense, the situation after September 3, in a way, it's, it's uh, uh, well, ironically, but it's uh, creating more opportunities for debate, more opportunities for discussion, and we, we are seeing certain processes that uh, in the civil society people are more, uh, you know, they are engaging in this discussion and there are certain processes going which might lead, uh, maybe I think in Armenia it would be important to have a uh, political force which would, uh, you know, openly and uh, unequivocally support the European integration. Because right now, most political forces in Armenia, with certain exceptions, they don't really have clear opinions, whether about European integration or about Eurasian integration. They are mostly afraid to alienate both sides. They won't, don't want to say things that the Russians will be upset about, but they don't also want to say things that the West will be upset about. So uh, I think this is where the civil society can come in, because the civil society doesn't uh, plan to you know, uh, try to take the power tomorrow. It's not planning to run in the election, so they don't really need to maintain good relations with all the actors. So that's where I think uh, maybe civil society can change something. Can civil society change something by watching Georgia, and I don't mean, you know, in the expected way, that Georgia's going in this direction can be both really bad for us or perhaps good for us good for us in the sense that we have something to watch and learn from and use as an example perhaps. Perhaps this will uh, be the evidence of what Europeanization may mean in a way that we didn't succeed in explaining to our public. We didn't, Europe didn't, we didn't. Now that Georgia has, is going down this path, the negatives are obvious, we're going in different directions. Is it possible there's a positive? Well, it's completely positive and it's already happening that people, you know, simply traveling to Georgia and seeing, for example, how the state uh, agencies work there and how it's different from the way they work here. They, they don't need to be told about democracy, human rights or rule of law. They see it just uh, right there. The problem with Georgia is that it's not clear at the moment where it is heading. I mean, it has become a little bit more clear today after uh, you know it was signed, mm -hmm. uh, but still they have certain issues with Saakashvili, who kind of refuses to leave the uh, you know <laughs> political uh, field, and uh, we we have to see how things are happening in Georgia. Of course, there will also be a strong pressure on Georgia from abroad, and I'm afraid that there will be an attempt to use Armenia in this pressure and. We have to resist that. But uh, I also think that even uh, apart from, you know, this, uh, whether we have signed or not this or that document, we, we're still, um, we are still a member of Council of Europe. 
as a member of the Council of Europe, we have certain obligations we have to fulfill. You know, no one said that because we are not signing the association agreement, we don't need to uh, continue to fight for human rights or uh, independent court yeah. systems. So and uh, our uh, civil society has to make the uh, you know effort to continue to hold the government accountable. Of course, we will have less leverage because before that the government had to Take implement off. certain reforms, but uh, probably now it means that we have to mobilize our resources to a higher extent. So those levers that we thought we would have with these thousand sheets of an agreement, we no longer have. How does this change our levers as far as uh, our neighbors go. I don't mean about you know, relations with Russia. We talked about it. You talked about the decision-making process. You know, if something that we had in common with Turkey was this common European aspiration, we can't say that anymore. How is this going to change some of those games? Well, I, I wouldn't say. I don't think it would change the way Turkey views the situation, but it will. Unfortunately, it might change the way. Uh, the West Europe sees the situation and uh, they might start uh, perceiving Armenia as a part of a hostile camp which of course will be not very uh, beneficial for us so we have to make sure that this doesn't happen from, and Europe's, the, perspective. from Europe's perspective and the same thing with Azerbaijan I mean uh, fortunately or unfortunately for us Azerbaijan also has to maintain this kind of balance between Europe and Russia just like we do so in this sense probably Azerbaijan has certain limits to you know how much it can try to bring Europe to its side but with Turkey of course we have to be very careful and we have to we also have to explain to Europe that probably the biggest reason why we are not signing this agreement is that we have this conflict with our neighbors and the policies of our neighbors because uh, after all the economic situation, the migration, you know, the, the fact that we have to spend a huge amount of money on defense, this all comes from the policies of Azerbaijan. So uh, we have to get this message out and we have to explain that uh, also Europe has to be more interested in the solution of these conflicts. It has to invest more, whether it's Nagorno-Karabakh or Mia turkey relations. Uh, of course, it's, it's not going to be easy, but we have to do it. You know, that scares me every time somebody says Europe has to invest more and get more engaged. Here's 28 countries that are struggling over everything. I can just see them sitting and voting about us. But, but of course, at the end of the day, Europe has to get more engaged. The conference is continuing, and speaking now is Luis Navarro, who heads NDI in Georgia. And NDI, the National Democratic Institute, does a lot of work in Georgia, a lot of opinion research surveys, a lot of support to political entities. And it's interesting that as part of this ex external democracy support conversation, it's really um, more Americans than, than we've seen in any of the rest of the, the uh, conference, including uh, Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada. The, we are still showing the conference live, and it appears to be a good time to go back to it and listen to what is being said about Georgia. And we'll continue to talk about the conference, the rest of today. Uh, stay tuned, come back. At the end of the summit, we're also going to be speaking with the head of the European delegation in Armenia, Ambassador Tryon Hirsteya. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Mikhail, for joining us as thank well. Thank you.